Clay uh, to our field science seminar. And um, Michael told me yesterday that he has quite the international background, and I hope I get this right. Um, he was born in Belgium. His mom, mother is uh, Austrian. But he grew up in Germany, and that is where he also received his PhD in Karlsruhe. And we know other people here that went to the same school, that is Ari, um, even the same advisor, Dr. Schultz. And um, after graduating, he went to South Africa to the University of Cape Town, which is where he is presently. And we are greatly looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, well, good afternoon. I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite issues um, in fischer tropsch synthesis, which um, are the product distributions and the kinetic modeling thereof. Um, most of the data I'm going to present today um, were generated during my days back in Karlsruhe, where I did my PhD, as mentioned, um, under the supervision of Professor Hans Schulz, who I believe some of you know quite well. Um, the input of Eric von Steen is also always much appreciated. He also comes from the same school. He's nowadays the head of the uh, Department of Chemical Engineering down at the University of Cape Town, where I'm located nowadays. fischer tropsch product, as our GC sees it, those are <coughs> products which are in, in the gas form at reaction conditions, typically. Um, those were um, obtained over a cobalt catalyst. Shows the range C1 to C18. It's quite a huge number of components, but if you take a closer look, we find repeating patterns within each carbon number fractions, which are, which is of course due to the fact that we're dealing with a uh, polymerization reaction here. If you take, for example, the C5 fraction, the major peaks are typically the alpha olefin and the linear, um, uh, the linear alkane. Then we have some olefins with an internal double bond and some branched compounds, some. Uh, some paraffinic branch compounds and some olefinic branch, branch compounds and so on. And we also find small quantities of oxygenates in this product spectrum. Now with iron catalysts, we typically find much more oxygenates and also um, and larger quantities of branch compounds. But in essence, we always find repeating, repeating patterns as, we increase, as, we, as we're moving through the, uh, from carbon number to carbon number. Now as we're approaching higher carbon numbers, we find that um, the spectra become more and more simple, uh, more and more paraffinic, that is. And we find one major peak, which is the end paraffin, and we have a number of uh, branched um, paraffins just before um, the, the, the major peak there. Now, well, this is how GC sees this. This is how we, we can see our product. Quite a large number of different uh, compounds at room temperature, some of them in the, in the gas phase others in the liquid phase. We mustn't forget that we're also forming quite large amounts of, of water. Actually, water is the main product of fischer tropsch synthesis. And we're forming wax, which is mostly paraffinic, and it looks, uh, our GC would see it as something like this. So just a uh, just, um, linear hydrocarbon peaks there. And to conclude, or to, to sum up, the major products are N-olefins and N-paraffins. In the olefins, we find alpha olefins, but we also find olefins with internal double bonds. We do also find some oxygenates, mainly alcohols and aldehydes. There are also some ketones around. And especially on iron catalysts, we also find acids. Then we do also have some branch compounds. Those are mainly methyl branch compounds. Now, if you want to start modeling this, we can start with a very simple model, uh, which was used by Schultz and Flory to, uh, to model ideal polymerizations and uh, ideal uh, polycondensation reactions. And they developed this very simple equation here, uh, which gives us the molar concentration as a function of the carbon number with a so-called chain growth probability as a parameter. The model is very simple. We have, a real, we have an absorption of carbon monoxide and hydrogen to form a surface species with one carbon atom, which can either dissolve a product with one carbon atom or grow to form a product with two carbon atoms, which can again dissolve or grow and so on. We can then define a chain growth probability, which equals the, um, the ratio of the rate constants of the growth step over the rate constants of the growth step plus the desorption step. Now, if we assume chain growth probability to be carbon number independent, we can make use of this equation here and if you plot this logarithmically over the carbon number, we do find straight lines 
the slope of which um, give us information on the chain growth probability. The flatter it is, the higher the chain growth probability is. Here, for example, 80%, 70%, and 60%. Now, this, uh, this is ideal schultz flory um, kinetics. It's often also referred to as AF ASF kinetics because it was adapted by a guy called Anderson. Now, due to the schultz flory kinetics, we do have certain constraints um, on to, uh, in, with respect to the um, to uh, um, product selectivities that we can obtain. We can make use of that equation and just plot certain carbon number fractions as a function of the chain growth probability. Chain growth probabili probability zero means we don't have any chain growth. It means we're just basically ending up making methane. Now, as we're increasing the chain growth probability, the methane selectivity will drop, and the chain growth probability means one chain only, which is infinitely long. Now, between those um, chain growth, or, or in between chain growth probabilities, we can, for example, find um, that the maximum middle distillate selectivity that can be obtained at a chain growth probability of around 85%. If we want more, we have to go for higher chain growth probability and crack this stuff down in order to maximize the middle distillate yields. Now let's introduce the olefins into um, this simple, very simplified model by allowing um, the formation of olefins from, uh, via desorption from an sp2 species on. So this can then desorb as either ethane or ethene and so on um, as, we, as, we go, as we're moving towards longer chains. Mechanistically, this can look something like this. We do have an alkyl chain on our metal surface, which grows, and this can be so to form the alpha olefin via hydrogen abstraction or hydrogen addition to form this paraffin here. And it is believed that this reaction here is much faster than that one. So that means that we can primarily expect um, the olefin concentrations within one carbon number fraction to be larger than, say, 50%, and we're typically expecting uh, it to be between, say, 70 and 90%, and we believe it to be carbon number independent. Now let's have a look at the real Fischer-Tropsch product. This is the, the based on the chromatograms that I showed you initially. Um, that's the very first chromatogram here. Or, or let's, let me tell you the, the reaction <coughs> conditions first. This was obtained on a precipitated cobalt catalyst at 190 degrees and those um, partial pressures. These reaction conditions were kept constant for a couple of weeks. So this is, we are pretty sure that those are very representative um, data that we have here for this, for this reaction condition. Um, that's the, that's, this is the logarithmic plot of the, of the molar concentrations versus carbon number. This is the chain growth probability that can be derived from, from those plots here. And those are the olefin contents in the hydrocarbons as a function of carbon number. Now, what we typically find is deviations from ideal kinetics with relatively high methane selectivities. You see that this first data point here is far above what you would expect due to ideal schultz flory kinetics. We do find an anomaly in, in C2. This data point here is much lower than, than you would expect. And we do find a curvature in this distribution, especially at low uh, carbon numbers. And this is going over into a, a straight line as, we, as we're moving um, towards um, higher carbon numbers. Correspondingly, we find very low chain growth probabilities in C1, fairly high chain growth probabilities in C2, a minimum in C3, and an increase, and this is leveling out here, at, high carbon, at higher carbon numbers. Now we also find a curvature in the, in the olefin contents, so there's, there's quite a deviation from what we would expect primarily. Namely, fairly high concentrations of olefins in the C3 fraction, which then declines almost explan exponentially as we increase in carbon number. C2 is again an exception. So there are quite a number of deviations from, from ideal uh, schultz flory kinetics. The question is, of course, why? And we don't have to look very far. I mean, it has been known for quite a long time that olefins can undergo secondary 
for consecutive reactions uh, during fischer tropsch synthesis. Let's take an alpha olefin like this, it can reabsorb to form an alkyl chain. And this alkyl chain can, of course, desorb to form, to form an alkyl, an alkane. This would be a secondary hydrogenation of, your, of, of an olefin. This um, alkyl chain can, of course, also grow further. And that would mean that we would, we would get an increase of, of our effective chain growth probability. That means that due to this, we would get a curvature in the schulz roy distribution. So there is a, sec a secondary effect on the schulz roy distribution. Now, we think that a, an olefin can also reabsorb in the penultimate, with the penultimate uh, carbon atom on the, on the metal surface, which can then be hydrogenated to form a paraffin, or it can dissolve and form an olefin with an internal double bond. It seems that this growth step is, is hysterically hindered because we're not ob obtaining very much methyl branches in our spectrum. So the main reactions that are known are hydrogenation, incorporation, and the double bond shift. We also sometimes see hydroformylation, hydrogenolysis uh, to take place, especially in um, systems which are fairly poor in, in carbon monoxide. Now, seeing that the alpha olefins are the main primary products of fischer tropsch synthesis, and that they can undergo quite a number of secondary reactions, it's very clear that their extent and the selectivity of those secondary reactions will determine the final overall fischer tropsch distribution. Now, and it's due to the work of, of Iglesias really that the impact of secondary olefin reactions on chain growth has become obvious. He did quite a number of studies. One example I'm showing here that was done on a ruthenium catalyst in a fixed bed reactor, quite a low ruthenium loading, 200 degrees, 2 to 1 ratio of hydrogen to carbon monoxide, 6 bar, and he varied the conversion in that case by varying the, um, the space velocity or the contact time with the catalyst bed. 5% conversion, short contact time. He already had a deviation from, from fluorokinetics. As he increased the contact time, this deviation became more severe. Correspondingly, he found much lower olefin to paraffin ratios or olefin concentrations, respectively, um, at the higher um, contact times. So there is a linkage of the, of the secondary olefin reactions and the effect on the, on the schulz fluorine distributions. He then went on and came up with the whole model and he depicted a scenario to take place in a, in a, in a catalyst pore which is under reaction conditions filled with, uh, with, the, with, the, with fischer tropsch liquid wax. Okay, this is a catalyst pore, there's metal distributed over it and on the metal, is, on, on the metal surface there's chain growth taking place, as depicted here. Um, this species can then dissolve to either form a paraffin or an alpha olefin. And then he thinks that uh, product transport limitations in the liquid-filled pores of the catalyst can due to increased residence times of those, of those compounds. And therefore, as a, as a result of this diffusion enhanced olefin reabsorption, the carbon number dependence of this is just given by this expression here and by the um, carbon number dependence of the diffusion coefficient. So in other words, um, the longer this pore here is, the more likely it will be for an olefin to reabsorb and undergo these, those secondary reactions. He then modeled this whole thing assuming that all rate constants are carbon number independent, C2 being an exception, namely 10 times more reactive than all the other, other olefins. And he also stated that this a direct hydrogenation of an olefin to a paraffin is negligible at what he called real fischer tropsch conditions, namely um, high concentration <coughs> is larger than 5% and total partial pressures larger than, um, total pressures larger than 5 bar and he attributed this to the inhibition of carbon monoxide and water. He then coupled diffusion and reaction and came up with a, with a Tiele modulus, which contains a term that describes the property of a catalyst, 
which in which it contains the length of a catalyst pore, which of course corresponds to the to the diameter of a of a catalyst particle, um, the porosity, the site density, and the pore radius. So again, the longer a pore or the catalyst, or the, the, the bigger the catalyst particle, the the more likely this event of olefin reabsorption would be, and the longer an olefin an olefin is, the, the slower it would diffuse and the more likely it, it reabsorption would be again. And the, the chain length dependence is just, um, the only chain length dependent um, parameter in this model is the chain length dependence of the diffusivity constant. Okay, here's a comparison of the model and some experimental results. With this, he was able to, to describe the deviations in a, in a, in a flory plot quite well. And this shows the C5 plus selectivity as a function of this structural parameter here. So as it increased the structural parameter, say in, by increasing the, the particle diameter, he found an increase of the, or he predicted an increase of the C5 plus selectivity. He then prepared a number of catalysts and found quite a, quite a reasonably good, good fit here. So there, we really have a, a parameter in hand which enabled, en enables us to, to predict C5 plus selectivity, which is of course a great, thing. Now, there's a second model here, and I don't want to go too much into detail with this, which he calls a CO hydrogenation model. In this case, CO depletion um, really uh, this comes, comes into play here, and uh, this is not really a, a model which enables us to give a full description of the, of the fischer topsch product, so I don't want to go into more detail here. Anyway, what he says is that non anisotropic sulfur distributions and the carbon number dependence of the olefin to paraffin ratios are simply caused by uh, different product diffusivities. However, when we tested an iron-based catalyst in a slurry reactor at 250 degrees, 10 bars, 2 to 1 ratio, and the same space velocities, and we used two different particle diameters which were quite different, namely a fine powder, 100 micrometers, and a 1.7 millimeter particle. This is more than two orders of magnitude in terms of the structural parameters of um, Iglesia. In both cases, we first of all found the same conversion levels, meaning that we don't have any, any mass transfer restrictions on the reactant side. It's quite important too. We found the same, exactly the same product distributions and the same carbon number dependent olefin contents. Now that means, of course, that it cannot be due to, to diffusion. Uh, all, the, all these deviations from, from, uh, from ideal distributions cannot be, called, cannot be caused by diffusivity. Now it was then that we decided to look uh, further into um, secondary olefin reactions, and we decided to do some detailed studies in a gradientless slurry reactor. Uh, first of all, we wanted to find out what kind of reactions do we do we see. Can we learn anything about the kinetics? Because there's not much in literature there. About the carbon number dependence, we decided to to co-feed alpha olefins of different chain length between C2 and C11. And then we also wanted to learn something about the effect of re of reaction conditions. For example, the CO partial pressure uh, or the water partial pressure. That's a nice thing about the slurry reactor. You can vary one single partial pres pressure while keeping the other uh, parameters constant. Uh, effect of temperature, we did those studies with different, different catalysts, for example, iron catalysts, some of which were alkalized, others not. And all of those studies were done with particles, uh, with very fine particle powders uh, below 100 micrometers in order to make sure that we don't have any uh, diffusional effect. Okay, this, that's just a simple drawing of our, of our setup. We have a slurry reactor here, which has an internal volume of around 500 mils, the liquid level being 300 mils. Uh, the pre-reduced catalyst is in this still liquid. We're then passing synthesis gas through the reactor, knocking out some wax here. After pressure reduction, we're adding a, a reference gas, which enables us to, to do mass balances. We have an, an inorganic compound and an organic compound in here. We mix that to that gas and we're taking uh, product samples at this point here. The olefins can either be added, say C2 and C3, which are gases at room temperature via mass flow controllers, 
or the, the higher olefins can be added with the, with the help of a saturator like this. The addition of the olefins was normally um, done over a period of at least 24 hours up to one week uh, in order to make sure that we have a steady, steady state condition and steady conversion and steady selectivities of the, of the secondary olefin reactions that we're looking into. Some results. The major reaction that we, that we observed was typically the hydrogenation of the, of the paraffin. We also found double bond shift and incorporation can, could, could sometimes be directly uh, observed. For example, we have our base case scenario here. This is the schulz flory plot of the of, of our base case, and then we're adding a certain amount of ethylene, and we find an increase of all the formation rates from C3 plus on, and the parallel shift here, which is indicative for um, the olefin acting as a chain starter. The same thing can be observed in, in all other carbon numbers. Uh, for example, here, upon the addition of octene, we found an increase from C9 onwards. Uh, we also found some hydroformulation with uh, cobalt catalysts. Now, what else can we learn about um, the kinetics? In this case, we varied the, the ethylene partial pressure by feeding different amounts of ethylene. Uh, this is shown here for two different uh, catalyst systems. Now, the conversion of ethylene and the yield of hydrogenation and the yield of ethylene incorporation are all independent of um, the ethene partial pressure. The same thing with this catalyst. Well, this normally tells us that this is a reaction which is first order with respect to the compound we're looking into. It's quite, a, quite an important thing when, when, we, when you do, we want to do any modeling that you know uh, the reaction order. We found this, the similar trends uh, upon addition of um, olefins with longer carbon numbers. Now, something on the chain length dependence. Here we added olefins of different chain length. Um, in this case, on a cobalt catalyst, at two different partial pressures. Now, what we find is always the minimum conversion is always happening in C3. And then we find quite a dramatic increase of the conversion um, with increasing carbon number. C2 is an exception. Now, what we're seeing here, for example, is what we're also seeing here is that as we increase the C or partial pressure, the conversion is, is going down. So we're forcing back secondary olefin reactions. In this case, we have a, an, an iron catalyst and an, an alkalized iron catalyst. Uh, we find the same trends with respect to carbon number. Um, if you compare the two catalysts, we see that the alkalized, and on the alkalized iron catalyst, we find uh, much lower conversion levels. That, mean, that means that one function of potassium, obviously, is to force back uh, secondary olefin reabsorption. And this is why we, we obtain, on those kind of, of, of catalysts, we normally get quite high olefin contents. Now, this increase here, with the increase in carbon number, remember those are added olefins, we're adding them from the outside, would not be expected if you have any transfer limitations. It's another very strong argument again against the, the diffusion uh, theory. We can then look into um, individual reactions, for example, the hydrogenation or the paraffin yield, if you want, and, and the incorporation. The incorporation we get from, from, a, from a via mass balance. We normally not, we don't observe this uh, directly. This is again for three different partial pressures on that cobalt catalyst. Um, hydrogenation is normally the major, the major reaction that we observe. And we, you find, since it is the major reaction, we find the same, the same trends with, res, with, with respect to carbon number, namely an increase as we increase in carbon number. Um, and the same thing with respect to C or partial pressure. As we're increasing the C or partial pressure, the hydrogenation, secondary hydrogenation of the olefins, as you would expect, is going down. Now we can compare this to the olefin contents of the corresponding base cases without any olefin uh, addition. And you can see these curves uh, are reversed, so it, it, they, they really show the, show the same or the opposite, opposite trend, if you want. So there's, there's obvious, obviously a link of the uh, secondary hydrogenation and these, these curves that we observe 
in the, in the corresponding base cases. Now, we can look into the, into the in incorporation yields as well, but as I said, it's a bit, bit dicey because this is a value that we only obtain by a mass balance. In any case, we do again find a minimum incorporation yields in C3, and this goes up with increasing carbon number, C2 again being exceptionally high. We can compare this with the chain growth probability that we can uh, calculate in, in, case in the three corresponding base cases. But we always find a minimum in C3 and an increase with increasing carbon number in C2 being exceptionally high. Again, if you compare those curves, there is some resemblance here, which, which seems to, to indicate that uh, secondary olefin reactions do indeed play a role in, in shaping the final um, product distribution. Um, the effect of, okay, we also stu studied the effect of carbon monoxide, and we did some, some simple kin kinetic, um, kinetics on that, just using a kinetic equation like this. So we, we are plotting logarithmically the ratio of the rate of, of olefin uh, consumption versus its concentration in the liquid phase over the logarithm of, uh, of PCO. And from the slope, we can derive the reaction order with respect to, to carbon monoxide. In all three cases, it's around, in all, all, all cases, all five cases, it's around minus two. Um, so that means there's a very strong inhibition of secondary reactions due to um, carbon monoxide. Um, okay, from the intercept, we can already see that these curves all lie on top of each other. That means that C3 to C11 have more or less the same reactivity. Now, we sh I show that here in this table. This is normalized with respect to propene 1.0, 1 1.9, 1.9. So they're all more or less, they're all more or less of the same reactivity. Ethylene being exceptionally reactive, in this case, 16 times more reactive than propylene. We normally find in, that it is between 10 and 20 times more reactive uh, than, than the other olefins. So the olefin reactivity generally is not dependent on carbon number, C2 being the only exception. Uh, we can then look into more detail as well. Um, um, what are the individual reactions that are taking place as we're adding N-octene over two cobalt catalysts at more or less the same conditions. As we're increasing the CO partial pressure, the hydrogenation selectivity drops, goes down to zero actually. Um, at the same time, the isomerization um, to octenes with internal double bonds does however go up. And the incorporation is, is going up and down a bit and seems to be around 40% in average. But in any case, isomer, direct isomerization and direct hydrogenation of the olefin cannot, cannot be neglected as um, Iglesia suggested. And last but not least, on those studies, the effect of temperature on secondary olefin reactions, just a simple Arrhenius plot of the, of the rate constants. Um, so from this we can get activation energies, they all lie on, on straight lines here. We can get uh, from the slopes activation energies which lie around 150 kilojoules per mole, which is quite large. It's, those are numbers that you wouldn't expect in, in the presence of, of severe um, mass transfer restrictions. So again from this I conclude that there's no um, transport limitations in this system. Let me just conclude these, these findings of the olefin co-feeding studies. Um, reactions of added olefins, hydrogenation, isomerization, incorporation, do reflect the selectivity of the base case experiments. The reaction conditions have a strong effect on the extent of secondary olefin reactions. For example, we find a very strong inhibition of those secondary reactions by carbon monoxide, and <coughs> for example, by adding alkali, alkali to, to, to an iron catalyst. Now, secondary olefin hydrogenation and isomerization must not be neglected. It's always taking place. Um, we found a first order dependence of olefin consumption with regard to the olefin concentration. Um, the reactivity of olefins is not chain link dependence, C2 being an exception. Uh, the selectivity of olefin incorporation 
is not chain link dependent. I didn't show this in the, in the slides. Um, Olefins with internal double bonds and paraffins do not participate in secondary chain growth. This is again something which I did not show, but we did some co-feeding of olefins with internal double bonds and they would not give us any, any incorporation. And diffusional restriction cannot account for the observed chain link dependencies, at least not in these studies here. Now, if it's not diffusional um, effects, what is it then? We believe that the product itself um, have a carbon number dependence in the reactor time, meaning the longer a, a, a paraffin or a, a product chain is, the more time it spends in the reactor. And just due to this, uh, it's, 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 it's more likely that the longer chain will, will react much further than, the, than a shorter chain would. Now, how can we understand this in our reactor system? We have a liquid here and a gas phase. We believe that those two are in a therm thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, which can be described with the partition ratio, which is nothing else but the sol solubility, namely the concentration in the liquid phase over the concentration in the gas phase. Uh, we can come up with some, some data on this, and what we typically find at 190 degrees, we find a factor of 1.5 increase of the solubility with incre per CH2 increment. So it's an exponential increase of the solubility here. Now, if you take this scenario and um, have, have the gas, gas phase and the liquid phase continuously exiting the, the reactor, we can calculate a simple average residence time as, as a function of carbon number, which is defined as the moles of, of, this, uh, of this carbon number fraction over the molar rates of this carbon number exiting the reactor. And we can introduce um, our partition ratio here and some um, some dimensions of our, of our reactor, and we can calculate the average reactor resonance time, and we find, that, find a, a dramatic increase as we're increasing carbon number. It's quite important to, to realize, and this is also why we had to, cook, to feed C11 much longer in order to get ste steady state conversion here. With C2, you can, you can do this in, in 24 hours, whereas with C11, we, again, we had to co-feed like 10, 11 days, um, up to seven days normally. Okay, now we're taking this um, scenario and the findings that we observed in the olefin co-feeding studies and put this into an extended kinetic model, which looks something like this. We have a growing surface species here as before on the catalyst surface, which can either dissolve to form what I call end product here, end product standing for a product which can not reabsorb anymore. So this can also be an, an, an olefin with an internal double bond. Or it does not participate in chain growth anymore. Or it can dissolve as an, as an olefin, as an, as an alpha olefin, into the liquid phase, that is. And the liquid phase is in thermodynamic equilibrium with the gas phase. The equilibrium can be described with the carbon number dependent uh, solubility. Both phases are continuously exiting the, the reactor. Now, I'm also allowing this molecule here to reabsorb as a species which does not partic participate in chain growth. Uh, this can, for example, then dissolve as an olefin with an internal double bond, or it can account for a direct hydrogenation of the, of the olefin. Um, all constants, all rate constants are assumed to be carbon number independent. This is something which we found in our olefin co-feeding studies, except for C2, which showed to be much more reactive. Thermodynamic equilibrium is given between the gas and the liquid phases, and this is where the carbon number dependence comes in uh, into our model. We do not have any; we're not considering any um, diffusional limitations, and we we uh, assume in steady state conversion. Okay, let's make use of this model, and we just come up with a with a number of mass balances around those species here. Uh, couple those mass balances and, and, and solve them. And we come up with a number of um, dimensionless parameters, such as the ratio of the desorption um, uh, of the desorption rate constant and the, and the uh, growth rate constants, which reflects the primary chain growth probability as not affected by um, secondary olefin incorporation. 
Then we have the ratio of the olefin rate constant and the, and the paraffin desorption rate constant, which uh, defines the so-called primary olefin selectivity. Um, and then we have a term which involves the adsorption of an, of an olefin here. So this step. And then we have just the ratio of, um, of the C2 reabsorption constant over the reabsorption constant of, it, of all the other olefins, which reflects the uh, reactivity of ethylene. And normally we put this on 10. And then we have the uh, ratio of the liquid volumetric flow over the gas volumetric flow, which is typically a very low value. We can al almost neglect it. Now let's play with this parameter here while keeping the others fixed, just by choosing. Um, we keep put this at 1.43, which um, equals a chain growth probability of 70%. This primary olefin selectivity we put at um, we we set it at 80% in this case. And then we're we're switching on this step here. So without any olefin incorporation, we get a straight line in the schulz flory plot. We get a we get a horizontal line in the chain growth probabilities versus carbon number, and we get a straight line here. Now we switch on this reabsorption of the olefins, and we do get, um, first of all, this, this um, anomaly in, in C2 here. So we have a preferred reabsorption of C2. And then as we go to higher carbon numbers, we do get a deviation from um, schulz flory kinetics. As we're increasing this parameter here, we find more severe deviations from ideal schulz flory kinetics. The same thing we find um, and qualitatively the same thing we find in this plot here. And there we see as we're increasing um, reabsorption rates of the, of the olefins, we find that we are pushing down the olefin, olefin levels. And we also see already that this quite nicely resembles the trends that we typically observe uh, experimentally. Now what's the role of the second um, surface species here? This, this is just scavenging the, the olefins, really, and taking them out of this reabsorption play here to form a surface species which is participating in chain growth. So that means without this step, we find a deviation like this, for example. We switch on this step, um, and the deviation will be less pronounced. Same thing as we're plotting the chain growth probabilities versus carbon number. This is what we get without allowing the olefin to go this route here. And this is what we get if we switch on this step. If we're switching on this, we're also lowering the, the total olefin content correspondingly. Now we made use of this model to fit our, um, our data. And again, all of those data um, were obtained on um, while in, in Fischer Tropsch runs where we kept the conditions constant over a very long period in order to make sure that these are really, um, that those are the real distributions here. Okay, and we can get quite reasonable trends here, or we can fit, it, fit those deviations quite well with our model. We just used it here in another case where we varied the water partial pressure over a cobalt catalyst, and again we can we can fit this reasonably well. Let's now look into the um, into the model parameters that we that we obtain. For example, here the alkalized iron catalyst versus the non-alkalized iron catalyst. The first model parameter, which is the the um, cha the chain growth probability, is not affected by uh, olefin reabsorption. Sixty-seven percent in case of the alkalized. 53% in case of a non alkalized So that means as soon as we're adding al alkali to the iron catalyst, we find uh, a change in the, in the initial slope of the anisotropic schulz flory distribution. Now this value I always kept at 80% at here. This is the, the primary olefin selectivity that we're assuming. Now we see that those two terms here, which deal with the reabsorption of the, of the olefin, either via the surface species that does participate in chain growth or the, or the other one which does not participate in chain growth. We see that in case of the, of the non-alkalized iron catalyst, those values are much larger, showing 
they were indicating that secondary olefin reactions are much more pronounced on this catalyst system here. Now, for those numbers, we can also calculate the selectivity of olefin incorporation due to this model here. And we find that we have a selectivity of around 38% of olefin incorporation as opposed to 62% of olefins which are simply hydrogenated or isomerized. Uh, this number with the, with the non alkalized ion catalyst is somewhat lower. So it seems another role of potassium is to selectively, if uh, any reabsorption does take place, it goes more selective towards incorporation as compared to hydrogenation. We can also look into the that effect of water here on the cobalt catalyst. As we increase water, this was done by water addition, by the way, from 1 bar to 8.5 bar, we found quite a dramatic increase of the primary chain growth probability. And we also found that with the high water partial pressures, the reabsorption of the, of the olefins is forced back quite, quite significantly. Now we can compare those numbers with the, with the, with the incorporation selectivities that we obtained uh, via the uh, addition um, experiments of the olefins. But again, this number is, is a very dicey one because it is obtained um, from, from, a, um, from a mass balance. However, if we look at it, it seems that we, with the model, we do over predict the um, incorporation selectivity. Anyway, ultimately what we need to predict product selectivity would be those parameters as a function of reaction conditions that we're currently uh, working on this. Now there are similar models around. So there are more believers in, in solubility, and I just want to mention them shortly. This is a group uh, um, at Shell around Gerlings. They have in their, uh, in their model, again, a desorption to an olefin and a paraffin. They do include a secondary hydrogenation directly uh, to, the, to the paraffin, and they also believe that solubility is the only chain length dependent parameter. Well, they also included physisorption there. They only did studies on a cobalt model catalyst, and these, all these studies have not been backed up by um, olefin co-feeding studies. A similar model is, is, is around from, it was out there from another Dutch group, Van der Laan and Benakis. Okay, let's leave the olefins behind now, because we also have to deal with some other compounds namely the oxygenates. We do know that oxygenates are being formed, especially on iron-based catalysts. How, we do not know. It has been suggested that there might be a CO insertion step be involved or the ad an addition of an alkalidine species and an OH group to form a species like this, which after desorption can either form an alcohol or, or an aldehyde. We do, however, know, and this is mainly due to the work from Emmett and, and Bert, that, all, that oxygenates can be effective chain starters as well, just like olefins. So we can include them into our model here in the same manner as we did, as we did it with the, with the olefins. So we allow the oxygenates to reabsorb and eventually uh, kick off a new, new chain. We haven't done this yet, we, we probably will. Uh, I just want to show you an example of the um, oxygen, oxy, oxygenates uh, concentrations that we sometimes find in, in especially um, alkalized iron catalysts, those can lie between 10 and 20 percent and they can be almost carbon number independent until they suddenly drop. So that's more or less the same phenomena that we find in, uh, in the oxygen mass. So this is why we believe we can, we can treat them in the same manner and we can include them into this model and then we have an additional contribution to the deviations from ideal chain growth. Then we also have the branch compounds, again, mainly methyl branch compounds. An example of the distributions that we, that we find, or that we found on, a, on the catalyst like this, uh, is given here. Those are the two methyl branched compounds versus carbon number, the three methyl branch compounds, four and five. Now, we can introduce a branching step into our very simple model here by allowing a surface species from C3 on to not just grow linearly, but to also grow via forming a, a methyl branch. So this would, this would lead to a C4 
to a branched C4 species, which after desorption would form isobutane or isobutene. And the same thing with the longer carbon numbers. Now the total chain growth probability would then equal the chain growth probability of, of uh, the linear chain growth probability and the chain growth probability um, um, including form, formation of a branch. Now in order to model these experimentally observed curves here, we have to introduce a chain length dependent branching, uh, a branching, branching rate constant. Um, so we did this here, and, and this is the, those are the, the plots that we, uh, we got. And we can then calculate the cha chain branching probability, and the corresponding linear chain growth probability deviates from ideal Schultz flory kinetics. And just due to this, if you then plot the, the linear chain growth, uh, the linear molar fractions, or the molar fractions of the linear compounds, <coughs> sorry, versus carbon number, just due to this, we do get a slight deviations from ideal chain growth. Well, you can hardly see it because it's, it's not much normally. And well, that depends, of course, on the, on the extent of, of, of branching that you find in your product. Although it's not, it's not that low in this, in, this particular, uh, in this particular example. It goes up to almost 15% in some carbon number fractions. Now, if everything fails and we still can't um, describe deviations from schultz flory kinetics, we can always come up with, uh, uh, we can always superimpose two ideal chain growth mechanisms which can either be due to several growth sites or several mechanisms, but yeah, I'm still waiting for the evidence there. Okay, let me just conclude. Real fischer fopsch product distributions can deviate from ideal distributions. Secondary olefin reactions do play an important role in the kinetic fischer fopsch regime, and their chain-link dependent conversion, which originates from carbon number dependent solubility, and or diffusivity, I'm not saying that it does not play a role at all, at least not in our, in our studies, uh, do account for um, non anderson schultz flory distributions. And the selectivity of secondary olefin conversion depends strongly on reaction conditions, which should be included in the predictive model. And a more complete description of the product distribution has to include the formation of oxygenates and branch compounds. Okay, I don't want to include without acknowledging some people here, namely Professor Hans Schulz, Eric van Steen, Mark Bry, um, financial support from Shell and the Sonderforschungsbereich, SFB. And I would like to thank you for your kind attention and, and your patience. Well, at the point where you indicated that uh, the model of Iglesia yes. is not quite adequate, you uh, showed proof uh, using iron catalysts there. Uh, I take it those are precipitated catalysts, and then later on in your results you also had other uh, catalysts which uh, were on carriers. Yeah. Uh, did you, at that very first point of uh, sort of going a different path from Iglesia, also do the uh, verification or the counter verification? Uh, using non-precipitated catalysts, because one can imagine that the precipitated morphology mm. would be rather different as compared to a structured catalyst where you just have the uh, metal on the surface. Mm. Okay, all of these catalysts were precipitated to, to start off with. Um, okay. If I indicated that there's silica around, it means that okay, it was a co-precipitation in the presence of the, of the support, which is normally silica. And it was very small quantities of this support. So. Yeah, okay, one of them was an iron catalyst, I, I agree that most of the work done by Iglesia was not on, was not on iron, he actually never claimed that the same um, holds for iron, what, what he's claiming to, to be true for, for cobalt and, and ruthenium, this is what he mainly focused on. Um, however, the, the co-feeding studies were done on, on a number of cobalt catalysts as well. And from the coal feeding studies, we also got quite a, num num quite a lot of evidence that uh, diffusivity cannot explain the phenomena that we, that we observe. So, yeah. Yeah. I think your results are pretty consistent. Uh, yeah. you know, just thinking that point mm. where you started deviating. No, we, we didn't approach it that way. Yeah. Yes. Regarding the high reactivity of ethylene yeah. or uh, the absorption, is that normally attributed to steric or electrolyte effects? 
Yeah, that's a that's a very difficult quest question. If you mm -hmm. actually, you, you don't find many explanations of, about this in, in literature. I would think it's it's a combination of both. Seeing that the reactivity is so much larger, I wouldn't expect this to be due just to sterical effects. I would expect a factor of two or three, maybe, because you have two atoms that that can reabsorb as, as opposed to. Uh, one at one carbon atom only in, in longer olefin, olefin chains. And electronic effects, again, I would not expect a factor of, of, of 10 or 20 just due to electronic effects, seeing that you're still uh, dealing with pi, pi um, electrons here. Um, if you have any, any suggestions to make, I'd be welcome. I would, I would like to hear them. <coughs> The reactivity is about the same based on what you observe. Yeah. So your explanation for this is uh, independent of the carbon number for yes. the all of That's uh, in disagreement with uh, Iglesias' diffusion limitation theory. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> there's a, hy a hypothetical question. If uh, that, uh, that train is uh, independent, uh, dependent of the carbon number. For example, the activity increase mm -hmm. with the carbon number increase. That will be agree with the Iglesias theory. Yes. Yep. But in another, on another hand, if the activity decrease with the carbon number, mm -hmm. so what, what's your explanation about that? Well, not, not trying quite sure if I'm, if I'm getting your question correctly. Okay, so for, for you know, what, what you observe is the activity yes. from C3 is about the same, yeah. right? It's about a one and based on the number. Yeah. The activity is the same. same. Yes. It's an independent of carbon number. Yeah. Suppose uh, if, uh, <laughs> mm. if, if I can get the, the, the number decrease yes. as the carbon number increase, yeah. how do you explain this phenomenon? Why, why should I explain the phenomena? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hypothetical question, so given that hypothetical answer. <laughs> why, would, why would you um, expect that? Is there any, what's the reasoning behind your question? If I, if I, may ask back. I mean, you know, if you for increase, so that would be agree with Iglesias, right? right? And uh, if uh, independent carbon number, that's a big, uh, that's a... Uh, Why should it I mean, decrease? I'm, 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 not, I'm not getting this. I mean, the, the, the chain length shouldn't, shouldn't play a role from, from a certain chain length on okay, that type. Maybe you have a, a slight inductive effect due to, <coughs> due to the CH. Because I, I, I read a, a source paper about that. Uh, what what, what, what he got? He explains about the... the Activity is about the same. I mean, for the olefin, olefin reduction or the cooperation from C3 to C14 or something. Like that. 11, yeah, yeah C11. It's about the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I re you will read the, 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 the number carefully. Also, you can, you can interpret that it has a decrease, a, a slightly decrease. Maybe a slight decrease. A slight okay. decrease. So, even there is a slightly decrease, how do you see it? That's, that's experimental error. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If not, consultant, thank you for a long time.